Hello, it is my pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you today. I'm going to use my time to tell you about the future. Yes, the future. I have seen it and it does not look good. I'm no soothsayer, so I'm not going to make broad sweeping claims. I'm a scientist, a scientist who sits on the cusp of technology and society. So what I'm going to say is based on science, data and facts. Based on this, I will make some assertions and suggest where we are headed. I'm also a believer in chaos theory. At any given instance, a strange attractor can change the course of direction. Who knew what a coronavirus originating in Wuhan in China would have a long lasting impact on how we interact, what we do, where we do things? Let me start by telling you three stories. These three stories situate us in our current context. The elements and constructs in these three stories shape where we are headed. Some of us may just accept the direction as a reality that we have to learn to live with. Others may consider taking certain steps proactively. So story number one takes me back to my student days at the London School of Economics. Back then, I was really interested in heuristic programming. I was also interested in natural language processing. Technologies we have today make all this possible were really in their infancy at that time, at least 30 years ago. So I started following the work of Bruce Buchanan at Stanford and the expert rule-based systems that he was working on. Back then, Buchanan was doing experiments with a system called Mycin. Remember though, that this was in 1984. Mycin was a medical diagnosis system. Well, the experiments did not go too far. Fast forward to today. The American Medical Library Association tells us that 7,000 medical articles are published in primary care alone each year. Think of the latest and the greatest research that is published in these journals. Now think of you as an individual visiting your primary care physician. What are the chances that your primary care physician is aware of the latest developments? It would take 20 hours of reading each day for an average physician to comb through everything published in their speciality. On the other hand, IBM's Watson can process tens of thousands of journal articles and provide conclusive evidence of research in causes and effects for a particular phenomenon. We can also search for treatment options for the specific patient. The computer will identify diagnostic tests that would enable a more refined set of treatment options and propose those to the physician. Artificial intelligence and data analytics are an interesting development. We are now able to identify patterns and connections that we would never before. Who would have imagined that there is a connection between taking a baby aspirin and preventing colon cancer? Who would have guessed that men who buy baby diapers also buy beer? All these are coming from bizarre connections found through data analytics. Hold on to this story for a minute and I'll come back to it. My second story is about virtualization of work. We hear a lot about this. Clearly, as we all know, we have made significant strides because of the pandemic. And these were out of necessity. Matter of fact, what we have really done is that we have accelerated the process. Virtualization in one form or the other began a long time ago. In 1858, when two, two steamboat powered battleships met in the middle of Atlantic Ocean, they connected two ends of a 4,000 kilometer long and 1.5 centimeter wide cable. This was the first time when Europe and North America were connected. Today, there are around 380 underwater cables in operation around the world. These span a length of over 1.2 million kilometers. In spite of the connectivity, work however, was still geographically confined. Perhaps 
One of the earlier companies to introduce a 24-hour virtual office was John Brown Engineering. John Brown does not exist in its original form anymore because of several mergers and acquisitions. But the company demonstrated that tremendous gains could be had by moving work around the world. Story number three is fascinating. In the world of medical advice, there are four kinds of possible interactions. Low tech, but rich in content, where we use printed materials such as HealthWise handbooks, Merck manuals, and other similar products. Then there are low tech interactive solutions. This is where you have telephone advice nurses. There are also high tech content rich interactions such as WebMDs of the world today. Um, interestingly, there are not many offerings in the interactive high tech space. Well, until a small little startup came around WorldDoc. It was among the early forays into telemedicine and it happened in 2001, 2002. But the company and the products were ahead of their time. Fast forward to 2020, when we were in the midst of the pandemic. 20 years ago, insurance companies and legal restrictions prevented physicians and insurance companies from being active virtually. Today, however, it has become a norm. In the US, we saw an almost 54% increase in telemedicine during the pandemic. After the pandemic, 21% of primary care interactions were expected to be online. As an example, in February 2020, telehealth constituted 0.1% of primary care visits. In April 2020, the number jumped to 43.5%. So given all this, I want to make three assertions. First, the organizational form of the future is the infonet organization. Second, the velocity of technological change is and will be significant. Third, the cycle of work is likely to change. When I talk about the organization logic of the future, I'm talking about how companies and individuals will come together to do work. The past represents a situation where companies had a strong internal coalition and a very weak external coalition. Many years ago, I started consulting with an insurance company. At that time, they had 12,000 employees. 8,000 8, of these were internal, and nearly 4,000 were external partners, agents, and other adjuncts. Today, they still have about 12,000 employees, but the equation has reversed. 4,000 of these are internal and 8,000 are external. This represents a situation where a company has a strong external coalition and weak internal coalitions. It represents a situation where people come together in amorphous masses to get work done. Implications of this move are significant and are changing how work and workers will evolve. For me, the new web of an enterprise with strong external collisions will have three groups of individuals. There will be the strategic brokers who will bring together interesting problems and solutions for the benefit of the organization. Then there will be problem solvers who will actually solve the problems that have been identified by the problem identifiers. If you analytically look around yourself and what is happening in different companies and businesses, you will see this division and emergence of these roles. Let me share with you some facts. Today, there are as many digital bits as there are stars in the universe. In 2010, we had zero exabytes of data. Today, we have 40,000 exabytes and one exabyte equals one billion gigabytes. As a comparison, one exabyte can hold 50 to 300 times the content of the US Library of Congress. In 2021, the number of connected devices is twice that of human population. There are half billion machine to machine connections. The probability of automation depends on the job, of course. 
median hourly wage is a good indicator. Our research has shown us that if the hourly wage is less than $20, there is an 83% chance that your job will get automated. If it is between $20 to $40, there is a 31% chance that your job will get automated. If it is more than $40, there is a 4% chance that your job will get automated. No doubt that while automation replaces jobs in some industries, it will lead to growth in others. For example, between 2016 and 2026, in-home health and personal care jobs are expected to increase by 34%. These are home health and personal care aids. I would like you to hold on to this thought for a minute as well, and I'll come back to it. My second assertion pertains to the velocity of change. Amazing things are happening there. The real drivers are computing power, real big data, communication speed. These have been enabled by devices that talk, especially Siri and Amazon Alexa. The convergence has resulted in robots becoming as common as cars and cell phones. In 2021, the US robotic market is valued at about $70 billion. May it be with their applications in cleaning, teaching, child care, in medical field, construction, farming, may it be in welding, assembly lines, or painting, may it be the unmanned aerial vehicles and exoskeletons in the military, they are all there. My third assertion is about the cycle of work and its evol evolution. When I was growing up, I just knew of three phases, study, work, and then retire. Typically, one would study till they were 25 years old or thereabouts. One would then work in the same career for 30 or 40 years and then retire. The reality is fast changing. Today, people have multiple careers. In the West, we are already seeing an individual having three, four, or even five careers in their working life, each interspersed with time off and some re-education. I see this all the time. Average age in the graduate program at my university has been consistently going up from the late 20s to now early 40s. So as individuals and even as companies, what are we supposed to do? I believe the key characteristics to be successful in the future are, number one, speed and agility. Companies and for that matter, individuals who can change directions quickly will be more successful. Success will be a function of adaptability. Number two, lower overheads. These can be in terms of office buildings, plant and equipment, payroll. These were all necessary in the old enterprise for control and predictability. The new enterprise will see less of these. We are already witnessing some of these changes where businesses rely more on contract workers and where companies do not see the need for office buildings. Earlier this year, British Airways announced that they don't see the need for their headquarters and are in the process of selling the sprawling buildings. Three, ability to switch directions quickly, particularly in terms of finding new opportunities as old ones disappear is another great success factor. Four, Ability to discover new linkages between problems and solutions. Five, going forward, there are few strategic brokers, problem identifiers, and solvers who work in high-value enterprises. That is in the sense of salaries and steady jobs. They share the risks and the rewards. The manifestation of and the implications of what I have been saying can be understood in terms of different task categories. I see work as routine and non-routine. It could be manual or cognitive. For routine manual tasks, technology can pretty much replace most jobs. For routine cognitive jobs, some of the jobs can be computerized. For non-routine manual jobs, technology is increasingly being used to automate the tasks. Non-routine cognitive jobs are relatively difficult to automate, but artificial intelligence shows some promise. So where does this take us? 
For me, the three jobs of the future are routine production services. These are the repetitive tasks performed by the old foot soldiers in high volume enterprises. These include traditional blue collar and routine supervisory jobs. This also includes many information processing jobs. Then there are in-person services. These are simple and repetitive tasks done on a person-to-person -person basis, perhaps with some vocational training. Waiters, waitresses, nursing home aides, janitors, taxi drivers, secretaries, all fall in this category. Then there are symbolic analytic services. These include problem identifiers, problem solvers, and strategic brokers. Research scientists, design engineers, software engineers, civil engineers, investment bankers, and a few creative accountants and lawyers fall in this category. Now, the consequences of these jobs of the future are significant. We will see the emergence of what my mentor, Professor Ian Angel, terms the new barbarian manifesto. Some jobs and some professions are simply going to disappear. When this happens, it is but natural for societies to look inwards and protect what they have, which results in increased disparities and the resultant security problems. The future is bleak. I have seen it, and we better be well prepared. Thank you.